Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Conversation of Our Generation, and this one is very special for you. I interviewed someone named Sean Boston from Boston Makes the One, that's at Boston Makes the One, the digit, on Twitter, and you can check him out there and see more of what he's got going on for sure. Lots of great stuff happening over on his podcast, and we really talked a lot about a bunch of different things actually, but primarily around the election. And so I thought it'd be great to get this out today with the election going on so that you can get a little bit of a look into how I'm thinking about things, how he was looking at things from a different perspective and just see what's going on. We talked about libertarianism, what it means to be a real libertarian, which I know is a huge point of contention for anyone who kind of considers themselves in that libertarian camp. (laughs) It seems to be like, what they argue about more than just about anything there is. Uh, We talked a little bit about the upcoming election, like I said, the secularization of our society about Justice Comey Barrett, which at the time had not been confirmed, so talking about that as well, and lots of other great stuff. Just really a really fun, interesting conversation, and I think that anyone out there who's looking to have these productive conversations with people who you agree and disagree with, which is everybody around you, because no one agrees with you 100% of the time. I think that this was a great way to do that and a good example, I think, on our part. And I think that's largely due to uh, Sean being willing to have that conversation with me and be a good partner in conversation there. So thanks to him for coming on to the Conversation for Our Generation. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I, I know you will too. So Let's go ahead and hop over to the interview. Thanks, Sean, for coming on today to the Conversation of Our Generation. I appreciate you joining me. Uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do over at Boston Makes the News? Well, it's not the news. It used oh. to be, and oh. now now it's not the news anymore, but the branding stuck, at least, or so I thought, and we're rolling with it. Um, I am a technically-minded politically cynical individual i'm i'm not uh, i'm not i can't claim any sort of thing more interesting than that uh, i'm someone who kind of got fed up uh learned a bit about myself and you know my own my own libertarian leanings uh you know small l if you're listening ted um <laughs> that guy follows me around i swear the, the specter of crowdfunded government follows me everywhere uh, <laughs> but uh he um the the show was based around like I, I couldn't go anywhere and do anything not that I really did but I was wanting to do something productive mm-hmm. uh it it does a lot for the the kind of the spirit of an individual to find some sort of productive thing that is really their own right uh and so I figure I'm gonna try and make it a podcast and it started with you know like I wouldn't I mean listen to my show but like the new stuff <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the first couple are, are me learning a lot about everything, like how to record properly, how to interview anyone. And uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't be here if I didn't get very lucky in my first interview, third episode, well, second interview, third episode uh, was a presidential candidate. Um, oh, who was not, it? Not, not one of the big ones. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was Joe Jorgensen. And then a couple of weeks later, Spike Cohen. So I, I, and I got to speak to some really cool people and I wanted to, uh, uh, to kind of keep that going. And so I spoke to people that I knew somewhat that would be interested in talking. And, and then, uh, eventually I realized that being a talking head is, um, it's played out. So I decided that, uh, I was going to gather my funniest friends from around the internet. And as I made new ones and bring them on this show and have them just, bag on each other for an hour and a half and then shake hands at the end and giggle about it. And uh, it seems to be that it's a more effective course of attack, at least for people having fun with the show, which really that's what it's about at this point. So that's awesome. I make a show where people laugh at things that make them uncomfortable. That's my hope. And uh, eventually learned that laughing at things that make you uncomfortable is a, not just a useful coping method, but it's something you can make other people do too. And it's great. <laughs> yeah, no, like I said, right before we started, one of my things is if you can't laugh at it, you can't live with it. And I come from a like Irish Catholic family that when you're at a funeral, it's sad and you have the, and then you go afterwards and tell all the stupid stories that the person did who just died. And 
enjoy, you know, and not enjoy, but enjoy each other's company and laugh about it because I think that that's just important. And with the way our news cycles are right now, uh, I mean, the one like, continuous news cycle that's been going since what mid Reagan with the uh, Fair and Balanced Act. <laughs> like, oh, it's a 24 hour news cycle. We have cable news programs now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I mean, I'm only 25, so I can't go back that far, but I can definitely say. Oh. I'm 27. I just pretend. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's awesome. And I think that it's great too, just figuring out a way to do something and put yourself out there to be productive. Like you said, that's kind of how this started was. I was with Conversation for a Generation. I was just kind of sitting around like, I want to put my ideas out there and see what sticks and just do something other than my normal job. And a couple of years later, after writing the blog, starting the podcast, which also, if you listen to the first 10 episodes is terrible on my end. I can tell you that, it, you know, you start to learn and you get into a bit of a groove and I feel like there's people who seem to enjoy this. So it's definitely cool for sure. But yeah, so you said that it's kind of more of a loose and free enjoying things with like, are what are some of the things that people, you know, come to the BMN podcast and find there? Like what sorts of things are you normally touching on with, as you kind of pal around and enjoy um, it. I like, I like to put, I like to put my finger on the pulse of what happened since the last show. Uh, but also I like hitting pop culture because I mean, frankly, if all you do is like, like on, on my last show, I did jokes. Uh, I, I tried to set up jokes, right? The whole, the whole idea is I'll ask questions. Those are setups for people's punchlines, right? And if they don't get the setup, they're clearly not going to hit the punchline. So I ask a question about, uh, Lindsey Graham's plan of attack to win his uh, win his election, win his campaign, and uh, he everyone gave answers like give out free s'mores and marshmallows. And I was like, do you even know who this guy is, man? <laughs> <laughs> like so, like I, the pop culture stuff helps me kind of uh, move through. So and mm -hmm. pop culture is fun to laugh at, anyways. You know, why it's hard to make a joke about Lindsey Graham sometimes if not everybody knows, but it's easy to make a joke about cardi b yep that's not hard i made a joke about cardi b at my wedding <laughs> yeah while i was up there mm -hmm. <laughs> that's in my, in my actual vows i did it oh man <laughs> yep. that's I'm committed cool. i love it that's funny. <laughs> yeah in the catholic wedding ceremony that i had we didn't get to write our own so no jokes in mine but, oh. <laughs> but yeah awesome well I think it'd be good, you know, talking about Lindsey Graham swiveling towards the politics side of things. I'm, I th well, obviously there's this thing coming up in a couple of weeks here. Uh, I keep getting reminded of every day. 12 days. Yep. 12, 12 <laughs> exactly. days, 12 days. And one way or another, somebody freaking lost. Let's have some fun. <laughs> and so what kind of things are you seeing? Like, I mean, I don't make you a prognosticator, but I feel like after the Hunter Biden stuff has dropped, that seems to me to be quite the October surprise. I, I don't know if I can think of. Oh, anything. he said it. Hashtag October surprise. Oh yes. no. I, it's, it. I mean, to be honest, it's like it's like uh, it's like watching it's like watching the Super Bowl, right? You know for a fact the last twenty seconds of the Super Bowl is gonna be three hours long. Mm-hmm. Right? You just know it. And they're going to pull out every obscure rule in the book because, you know, there's, there's too much on the line, too much on the line. This is the greatest, this is the most important election of our time. Uh, okay. That's a nothing burger of a statement, right? It's, I mean, people have been saying that since, uh, since uh, um, all that commercial with Daisy, you remember the Daisy commercial? No, I don't. I was a political ad from the, um, from the, oh, I forget when, I forget when, but it was like this little girl picking petals off a of daisy. He loves me. He loves me not whatever, but she was counting down from 10 or no, she was counting up. She counted up. And when she got to 10, it changed into like a, a launch countdown <laughs> and then counted backwards, freeze framed on her face and zoomed in like a TikTok, and then hit her eyeball at one. And it showed the reflection of a mushroom cloud. And then it just went black screen, the odds are too high for you not to vote this November. <laughs> I was like, 
wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't do that anymore, at least. Good Lord. Like, imagine if someone goes, if you vote for Donald Trump, you're going to get nuked. <laughs> We're all going to die. And some computer somewhere is going to choose to just turn us all into slag. And it'll be because of the decisions you made on November 3rd. <laughs> at least we don't do that uh, yet. Yet. <laughs> exactly. There's always time. Don't lose hope. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the last ad that they just played from Biden was quite ominous with the little like one key at a time playing the star spangled banner and the 1980s voiceover guy talking about the rivers are republican or democrat the mountains are republican or democrat was it, oh was this it is, like southern sounding like no rivers, it was like the rivers aren't republican or democrat <laughs> no it, wasn't, it was just like i don't know it was every guy who did the like Hey, this is Johnny, and he came and ran into trouble. Like every movie voiceover trailer thing you've ever heard. Oh, like like, a, like the movie guy. Yeah, it was. I think they actually got him for this. For I wouldn't this be ad. surprised. They got Sam Elliott to do a Biden ad too. Mm. Yep. A lot of hey. people are going to be real twisted up about that. That's all <laughs> I gotta say. <laughs> if you judged a book by its cover, well, sometimes you eat the bear, and sometimes the bar eats you. <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly but it was just funny because i'm like this is just so there's nothing that screams biden's campaign more than running an ad that could have ran that he could have ran against you know and the last time he ran for president in like 88 when he got kicked when he had to like leave it sounds like they just saved the ad for the last 35 years or whatever it is it's pretty yeah funny. And you know, you know, it's like, okay, two minute warning, right? And then all of a sudden everyone goes, okay, we had this in our back pocket since like May of 2016. We didn't quite make it in the last one. So we're going to save it for next time. <laughs> we already know we're running Biden. The primaries are not really up to popular decision anyway. So what are you going to do? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Well, he's, yeah. It's I met really a guy today that told me he was writing in Bernie Sanders. And I was like, okay, vote your conscience, brother. Yeah, I feel like I, I really can ride in Kanye personally because I am walking the knife edge between voting because there's local people on my ballot and picking the ones that align best with libertarian values, mm -hmm. uh, trying to do my research and realizing all I'm doing is hitting a wall of propaganda mm -hmm. and not really seeing like you could go with a voting record and even but even then voting records are bought and paid for, mm -hmm. right? They're bought when the party gives you your money to run your campaign and they're paid for when you vote the way the party tells you yep. so is it really an individual ever that's the question so i'm on the knife edge between voting my principles and just putting the thing in a fire pit and using it as kindling <laughs> that's i don't fair. know it might I, be that way. It, what what uh what state are you in? Just out of curiosity, because that also is a difference maker. You want to make a guess? Well, I know your uh, time zone, but I, so I'm, I know you're on the West Coast. Well, you've only <laughs> but, got three choices then. <laughs> How hard can it be? And, and and basically, they're all the same thing, right? It, it's true. it's welcome to the state where your vote doesn't matter unless you're blue, but then it also doesn't matter because it's going blue anyways. Yeah. So if you have a year where you're like, ah, this guy doesn't really line up with me. I don't think I'm going to play that game this time. It doesn't matter, right? It only matters if you do what they want you to do anyways. Yep. So it's like this like false sense of free will or, or input or possibility, unless you live in a battleground state. And mm -hmm. then even then in those states, I mean, I don't know how like widespread it actually is, but we are seeing, you know, I wouldn't call them representative of anything, but isolated reports of ballots being destroyed. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, yeah, so it's not, it seems to be happening more than it definitely should. And the fact that people say, well, there's no record of it, it's like, well, yeah, because we haven't done this before. That's like saying, we can't vote online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If, we, if we're going to let other people screw with our ballots, we may as well just let them screw with all of them. That's all. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> if you're gonna run, if you're gonna crash into a concrete wall, you may as well do it full speed. Mm -hmm. Gas pedal, bud. For sure. <laughs> but and so then I think that I'm curious to get your take on kind of the libertarian question of 
do you vote third party to you know bring what are what are your thoughts on that like voting libertarian you leave leave crowdfunded government out of this <laughs> he's on every podcast and that's that's what he talks about really but yeah he's very he's his, his position is very much uh use the duopoly to our advantage right mm-hmm. stop running libertarians start running you know, st- stop running capital L libertarians and start running lowercase L libertarians, capital Democrats and Republicans Yeah, and subvert the duopoly. It would be easier than trying to make it a triopoly or a, mm-hmm. create a tripartisan effort. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it, in my case, um, well, I'll tell you one thing's for sure. Uh, I cannot, I cannot put any money on any, uh, I wouldn't put money on any horse other than other than the libertarian this year. Mm-hmm. Um, between between the two major and the two biggest minor parties, uh, I've got mine. I'm confident. Uh, I don't know that it's necessarily going to pay out, but uh, anyone who claims to say you're not going to hear much about me and I'm going to leave you mostly alone, that's a pretty good argument for this one, especially coming from government. You know, well, that's your wife. Yeah particularly from government like (laughs) hey like listeners don't leave me alone like yeah i meant that to the government like please (laughs) shill (laughs) yeah no exactly i i kind of you know waver between the two as well like you have people like thomas massey like you know ron and Rand paul who can sort of get in there and get those ideas out there and actually make libertarian voting decisions and things that have consequence but it's also good i I don't know i think it's good to get the message of liberty out there and what it means and i think that all the squabbling among libertarians both small l and big l libertarians about how that happens is the reason why they don't get more than three percent of any vote because they're just always whining at each other about stupid tactical stuff instead of just putting the ideas out there in a not like not that plan, is a, that plan is a form of aggression you're not a real libertarian <laughs> Fair. you violated Fair you violated my nap time yep <laughs> <laughs> you just gotta yell nap really loud and <laughs> nap <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's i don't know I think that America needs a nap. Go to sleep, America. <laughs> I could use a nap. I will say that. I swear. I promise. I promise. My first campaign slogan will America will be America needs a nap. Go to sleep, America. Yeah. I love it. You got my vote. If that's the case. Or better, better yet, go back to sleep, America. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to see here. Just backroom deals and payola nothing to worry about yep exactly so yeah i mean i both arguments are valid like i have no problem in the world with someone saying yeah the fact that if you put three libertarians in a room you have a riot and there's only three of them yeah of course i I totally get that i mean it's blatant like if you if you're matriculating through liberty podcasting i mean it is blatant so Mm -hmm. it's it's not it's not like uh it's not like a like one of those like uh, canards or or you know silly stories that aren't exactly true but kind of are. No, it's it's a legitimate fact. Mm-hmm. You put you put two people who disagree in a room. They, they might call themselves libertarians, but I guarantee you, someone's going to lose a tooth and the other one's going to be a fake libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and they do that publicly as well on Twitter, where like I just see people like knock down and drag each other out. And I'm like you guys probably agree on so many things. Why don't you just, there, there's one guy who I listened to for a while and he's like, you know, just hop on the bus with me. And if you have to get off on the Liberty bus, like you're like, this is my stop. I'm not going any further. That's fine. I want to keep trying to move the bus that way. But if you're going to ride with me to make, you know, expand Liberty and grow that and anywhere that you and I agree on those things, let's do that together because that's what we need right now. And I think that if more people took that mentality, you're like, you might have less infighting between the anarchist voluntarist wing and the like big L like party type libertarians. Yeah. I hear, I hear lots of talk of like, 
what, what is it? I, I swear to God, like, like someone said, uh, um, anarcho, what is it? The, you know, the anarcho insert a blank word here. Uh, I think there's someone who's trying to make anarcho coalitionalism a thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to me, that just sounds like bottom unity. And uh, there's so many arguments for that. But then there's there's like this nasty, really dark argument that uh, if you align yourself with someone who is not trustworthy, they will take advantage of you when they've got what they needed from you, mm -hmm. right? If they use the fact that you form a coalition to then reform the government, uh, you're their biggest threat now. Mm -hmm. And if they're going to allow that to continue and all that jive, right? So there, there's there's arguments against it, but realistically, uh, I even think the libertarians have it wrong. I'm I'm just here because this is it's the closest place to a political home that I'm likely going to get, mm -hmm. right? It's not uh, it's not that I'm like a card carrying member. I mean, I'm registered that way just so I get the option to mm -hmm. vote that way. But it's it's more of a um, it's more of a like someone's gonna be like you're just, just such a freaking prag man such a prag and you know whatever i mean so be it but if i'm interested in finding a way to use the existing systems the existing methods making small useful changes ideas of like social programs going from a crutch to a ladder that kind of stuff very like very lightweight but important changes that will not hurt Son of a Hmm. Uh, very lightweight, important changes that uh, that do well for people, and you know, obviously, try not to harm. Try not to try to do a little bit better than just basic fifty-one percent utilitarianism. Yep, I agree. And and the other thing too that I think so many libertarians miss is if you are doing, if you're pushing away from the amount of harm that we are doing, if you are reducing taxes, if you are kind of re changing the way that social programs work, where like you said, it's a ladder. Would you say ladder, not a? Uh, to go from a crutch to a ladder. To a ladder, thank you. The the best example of it being, uh, I think Jim Gray explained this in a in a video he did, but he said uh, taking like welfare programs that go away when you earn above a certain amount, people will stay underneath that certain amount, exactly. right? Uh, but if you make it to where it rolls away at the rate of fifty cents for every dollar additional you earn, it tapers off like this, like 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 a like a curve yeah. right mm -hmm. it, it tapers off and rounds and what that does is that still rewards people for improving uh yeah. very much so like like oppressive tax bracketing systems and progressive tax right you can do the same thing with a flat tax now i've heard lots of arguments against lots of arguments for but if you're going to do things like people earning more than four hundred thousand dollars a year look out i'm coming for you mm -hmm. right uh those people, you know, going from whatever they're paying now to 62% in the state of California, uh, mm -hmm. plus a 240 something dollar tax per thousand dollars put into your 401k. Wow. That's really gnarly. If you make more than $400,000 a year and you put a thousand dollars into a 401k, part of this proposition is supposed to, part of this proposal is supposed to say that part of that needs to be taken from you too. Well, guess yeah. what? Now you got $750 in there. When you go to pull it out, you're going to get taxed on it again. If you pull it out or give it to someone else when you die, you're taxed on it again. Mm -hmm. That's three taxes on the same money. Yeah. Spent zero times. Exactly. We're not it, rewarding good behavior. Yeah. And yeah, we don't reward saving. We reward spending instead because we have the hidden tax of inflation as well. And, and that's where I come from is if you can kind of move things in the right direction and obviously you want to also reduce your tax liability as much as possible in the here and now, right? By figuring out whatever you can do to deduct or save on that totally. And I think that there's a lot of libertarians who just focus on that one side of things. Whereas I think you can do both at the same time. You can say, hey, you know, I'm working from home. I'm going to figure out ways to use that on my taxes, this, you know, this next year for sure. But also could we get people in there who are going to actually cut taxes? That would also be really nice too. Let's get both to happen at the same time. Well, and, and there's, there's this crazy thing. I logged into my retirement account and there's like a planner that says, you know, here's how much you need to put in by the time you retire so you can take out money and live at the same expense level as you live now. 
it plans that I need $8,500 a month in expenses to live the way I'm living right now. That's entirely based on inflation. Yeah. I have, uh, what, approximately, mm, I want to say close to 40 years, mm -hmm. probably going to be about 70 or so that it'll, it'll be when I retire that I can retire. So I have about uh, 40 years at 3% a year. The value of the dollar is going to cut more than in half by then. Mm -hmm. And that literally is, a, that is directly theft. And it's yep. due to negligence of people playing modern monetary theory instead of thinking about, you know, oh, that's great. We have steady positive inflation. That's what we want. No, it's not. <laughs> like, who, in, what, in what mind did someone tell you, yes, let's get C minuses because they work and let's just get 300 of them. <laughs> yeah. It, and especially, yeah, the steady... Yeah, I don't know how to tell people that that's not true from, I know a lot of people, and especially like, I know that in my economics classes, I, you know, in college, they would say that if you want, you know, a one and a half or 2% inflation rate is steady and it, you know, get your growth rates. I'm like, but what if, hear me out, there was like a gold standard or something like that and inflation that you are, there's actual real value somewhere that you're comparing your dollar against that it is a portion of, you know, it represents at the original time that the dollar was created was it was a 20th of an ounce of gold. That's what it traded in for. And so inflation and deflation happened when you printed more versus the amount of that you had. And so you could kind of fluctuate both ways, but just the steady growth is a hidden tax that we don't see. And I don't know how to get people to see, I don't know. The, the easiest way I think for people to see the effect of inflation is to imagine if they needed to work for 40 years to retire and they, and they need to have double the amount of money they have right now to survive then. Like look at a retirement planner, just go look at a 401k planner and, and see what it is they want you to have every month to survive. Right now, imagine that you're dealing with a fixed income type situation. Like your grandparents, I had, I had very, I, I still do. Uh, but when I was younger, I, I spent a lot of time with my uh, dad's parents, my grandparents on my dad's side. And they were very generous and had done everything the way that they needed to throughout their lives. They had good careers. They planned up, up in advance. But still, at the end of it all, they still were living in a situation where everything was fixed mm -hmm. and it was steadily decreasing. Mm -hmm. Right? And if people don't seem to understand that, that you have that you have like the, the nature of money to just disappear from out from under you, but you don't feel it because, you know, it happens so slowly, mm -hmm. right? Like, like you, if you stare at the clock, you don't see anything move anymore, right? But then you wake up 10 minutes later and it's moved. Yep. Well, by then it's too late, bud. Yeah. You don't notice that your Kit Kat that was a 97 cents last year is now a dollar when you go to the grocery store. You don't notice that, but you know, when my grandpa would buy me like a pack of baseball cards or something like that when you're a kid. And he's like, I used to buy these for a nickel. And now this pack is $4. And definitely manufacturing has been cheaper since, you know, when he was a kid. So it's like, well, that's, I just remember looking back at that and seeing, hearing old people complain about prices today is an exact example of what inflation does. They weren't wrong, guys. Those of you listening, they weren't wrong. It's just, it takes years and years and years for it to be perceptible. But by the time it's perceptible, it's already hurting everyone, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the, the effects that things can have to make inflation worse when you demand that people who work for a certain value be paid above that. Right. And now the very, the, you know, the rising tide that lifts all ships. And when people want, people say, okay, how do we determine what we can't go? Okay. We got a loaf of bread here. Right. We're pretty sure it's worth about three twentieths of an ounce of gold. So we're going to call it $3. It's literally just, we think the average American should have to work 14.5 minutes to buy a loaf of bread. Yeah. It, yeah, that is true. When you start measuring your like money by the time it takes to earn it, I think that that puts a really different context as well. And it might, how long, yeah. How long do you have to work to pay your rent? Yeah. 
Oh god. That's that's an inflation proof number. Mm-hmm. Frankly, like it 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 will not improve uh, not inflation proof, but like you can't use inflation to mask it. Mm-hmm. Right? It's 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 visible. Like if it takes me if I don't get raises and it stays stagnant, right? In um uh, in 10 years I'm going to have to work 30% more hours yeah. to pay my rent. Mhm. 30% more hours is more than an extra day of work. Yep. And I think it also gets disguised too by the, by the way that goods have become cheaper as well. Like it takes fewer man hours to buy a TV, right? If you're doing it in time, your TV, your phone, those sorts of things, like the capabilities and stuff that the technology has, you, you can, despite inflation, you can still buy a bigger basket of goods but some of those mainline things, your big, your big expenses has not actually become more reasonable. I don't houses. know. Houses have not become more reasonable. You could argue they've become harder to purchase mm-hmm. because zoning regulations and restrictions have not made things easier. And the amount of people needing houses has increased mm-hmm. because yeah. people like making babies. <laughs> yep. And, and you also have rent too, I think is another thing that seems to me to trend potentially even worse especially in cities like indianapolis i had my house that i bought fresh out of college because i stayed home and saved and worked full-time through college like i have friends who are paying almost twice as much as my mortgage to rent an apartment downtown that was a one bedroom probably are you down are you downtown as well no i'm i'm in a trendy ish area that's definitely a good value for what it is um kind of on the north side of Indy, but yeah, it was, it was just insane to see. And then I have a friend who lives two miles from me who has a little townhouse thing and probably similar square footage and their rent for them. My two friends to share it is like five, six, 500, 600 bucks more per month than my mortgage. And rent here has just gotten crazy. I don't know what it is, but it's it's probably the regulation. I live. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it's it's not the same as California or anything like that. But I'm in I'm in one of the fabled Southern California beach cities, so that's as um, much as you're gonna find out. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, that's a totally different volume. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like people who li- like if you live in the East Bay, or you know, even outside, like they they did this. Like the people who lived are like, man, San Jose is not that cool of a town. Let's Let's go right outside San Jose and put in the biggest tech company the world has ever seen. Okay. Wow. Everyone wants to live in San Jose now. Why? Damn it. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) I mean, it's, it is, it is a market-based thing. There's huge demand for these poorly built homes that turn into, you know, that, that, that turn into multi-million dollar shacks and it's just annoying. Like I see Craigslist ads in in San Francisco for, a tent in somebody's backyard for like $200 a week. Mm. Something like just trash fire like that. <laughs> like it's, you know, it's, it's really, it's a really great tent. It's like two minutes to the, um, to the, to the trains. That's yeah. how we get around out here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's like, oh. is that is a justification to pay $200 a freaking like a month even for a tent? You're like, I think I could buy a tent for two hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I could, yeah, but but do you have somebody's backyard to put it in? Hmm. Well, that's a good point. Hmm. Or, oh yeah, I'm sure I'm sure you could sleep in somebody's living room, but do you have the partitions to give a sense of privacy? <laughs> you can just put the tent in someone's living room, and then and then you're on. <laughs> I've seen I've seen stuff on Craigslist like people who take like bankers boxes full of old records from their business and they segment off their living room into three places barely big enough for a bed and then hang a curtain and they go I'm renting that out that out and that out. That's insane. Can I get a nope? <laughs> like that is wild. I, it's it's just it's trash and 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 those cities are not getting better to live in. They're not nice places to live in. They're, they're uncomfortable to live in things are you, driving around them is difficult. Parking is even worse. The rent is sky high. The cleanliness has gone dramatically down. The crime rates have gone dramatically up, but the prices stay high and get higher. 
<laughs> yeah, it's. I don't know what they're smoking, but they're getting pretty high. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it, it's crazy. I I didn't realize that it was that bad as far as like partitioning out all that stuff. I mean, I I have a friend who lives who moved out to like Oakland and pays way too much to live in one of those places, like in an apartment that is not in a safe area. Um, Oakland's Oakland's pretty bad, yeah. But like, there's there, there's some really cool parts of Oakland though. Like yeah, that's what he said. It can be really cool, but where he is is not necessarily the best. And no, no. I'm like, dude, why would you do that? Like, I don't know. Especially no, when no, I, you can there's a, there's like a, a like a kind of regionally slash nationally famous sushi bar and jazz lounge mm-hmm. in Jack London Square called Yoshi's. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to get out there. I haven't been there, but I've, I've been, I've been out in that area for other stuff I was doing. There's a, there's a really cool, like really high end board game, war game, role-playing game store out there. You know, there, there's some, there's some really cool stuff if you're willing to go take a look and find and be out and about, but I don't imagine living, you know, in a place where you're probably better off taking the fire escape to the street. <laughs> <laughs> than walking down the shared hallway yeah uh i don't know bud yeah that's that's the thing is that's the whole thing about california in general is that there's so many beautiful things so many cool like iconic areas of california because i mean every movie from like the 20s until now is it seems like every other one is set in california and it makes it glamorous and everything and yet it's just like i want to go out and visit but you know I mean, I obviously can't afford to live there at this point, but I, I want to go out and visit and see it all. But it's like, I don't even know what parts are okay anymore. It seems like what I hear about LA, what I hear about some of these cities, San Francisco, it's like, what parts of those areas can you go to and not run into the tourist areas? Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I, I mean, the, even my, one of the places I like Sacramento, that's, that's, a, that's an area I like, cause it's, it's got a lot of the mixed up, you know, eclectic vibes, but it's not so weird. Mm-hmm. It's old parts of it are old. So there's a lot of that charm. Um, but it's also one of the more affordable metropolitan areas to live in that isn't, you know, in Dust Bowl. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, meaning the giant, desert donut all in the center of the state um it's it's pretty nice it, and and it's it's better it's easier to live out there than down here uh i could easily have a lot more a lot more house for the same dollar yeah than i could if i was here although i don't know compared to indiana i i wouldn't i wouldn't know particularly but yeah. then you know people saying lots of stuff nowadays but if you can find a way to hold it down uh you're winning wherever you are you know I agree. I think that that's, that's the big thing is as far as libertarianism and liberty goes, I think that the biggest thing you can do is be responsible and create as much liberty for yourself by doing the right things and taking the game as it is, you know, (laughs) moving out to the country, learning to pickle, pickle cucumbers and jars and subvert the state with the use of the free market. (laughs) Counter economic, baby. (laughs) There you go. I am I am taking a mead class in about a month, about three weeks. Right. That's awesome. I don't, I don't think I'm going into business or nothing, but uh, I'm probably going to, you know, get myself off the hook for a few Christmas presents that way. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. And, you know, I, I want to learn how to make mead as well. I have friends who live like an hour away from us, and so we don't see them as often, but they've been making a lot of beer and like some meads and everything. I'm like, you guys need to just come down, show me what you do. Cause I just need to like, I'm a learner that like, I can't watch, I can watch YouTube videos and learn things. And I listen to podcasts and I can learn ideas. But when I listen to the podcast where they talk about making need, my, the survival podcast that I listen to, it is, I, I just don't understand what's happening. I'm like, I can't visualize what is being said. And so I need to. Um, Modern Rogue has a video on YouTube about mead making and they have a pretty pro guy on there helping them modern rogue is pretty sick i i I gotta gotta like it but uh they they do one there and they do a very simple one they use they just they do the the ferment um they do the fermentation in like a five gallon bucket Mm -hmm. they don't use fancy carboys or anything like that they just five gallon bucket with a little seal in the top you know a check valve in the top and 
it, they explain the process and, and go through it and they do a very simple first batch type thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it got me interested. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. I, I have to, I have to see that. And then I have to figure out what to do with five gallons of mead because I don't have a lot of fridge space. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I guess I, I get just that. Put it down. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not endorsing overindulge. Oh, cool. yes, I am. <laughs> I drink I'm up. So. Catholic, so there's a little bit too much overindulging from time to time. Well, ain't that a crazy thing? <laughs> but yeah, no, that's that, that's definitely interesting. One thing that I wanted to ask you about too is obviously we're in an unprecedented time supposedly where we're about to nominate a Supreme Court justice. You know, it it looks like Monday, which I saw someone point out that that is also Hillary Clinton's birthday. So the <laughs> on Twitter. Oh. Oh, that's hilarious and then it's also my anniversary my first anniversary as well so i got married last year apparently on hillary clinton's birthday which i found out after the fact and then so definitely a big day for me I well you can you can uh you can uh, give your your wife an anniversary gift and say hey here you go uh, a supreme court justice that's clearly just gonna overturn every you know democrat decided position and mm -hmm. yeah, hopefully, hopefully you like it because that's the gift yeah. you get. <laughs> Not our anniversary. You're like, no, I. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, dude, I can't stand like the people. People are. Oh man, I hate to say it, but a lot of people are just really ignorant of the civics involved in the operation of uh, of the Supreme Court. Like they think that the Supreme Court is just they're just like the word that went around Fox News is super legislators. Mm -hmm. Right. They're, you know, unelected uh, people with very little check on them that have the ability to overturn laws and make new ones and change funding. And uh, yeah. And while they have done some of those things at times, I will say, I don't think it was great when, you know, Justice Roberts all of a sudden decided that the ACA was a uh, tax, not a mandate or th they, they do find ways to overstep their bounds but the world doesn't end we've had some pretty terrible justices i mean fdr appointed a head of a of the clan at one point blackman was i believe it was blackman if i call blackman a clan's member and he's not someone correct me but i'm 99 percent sure uh it was him watch them slander laws bud man you're dragging a good man's name through the dirt yeah, you know what? Out of the, if you are thinking of, they can come out of the grave and try to sue me. But <laughs> their estate lives on. I think it was him. I can't remember for sure. But one of FDR's appointees was like literally in the Klan. And you know what? They made some pretty bad decisions for those years about what they could do because, well, I mean, you had a white, an actual, like, not like a, hey, this guy's a Nazi supposedly when they just like kind of leaned somewhat conservative. Like he was literally a white supremacist and still we fixed whatever damage he did because I mean, we're sitting here with, you know, the civil rights law in effect and the ability for anybody to pretty much live freely enough based on your race or whatever else. So. I mean, there's obvious, obvious moments that are uh, extremely troubling to say the least, uh, but the way that people go about solving them and the way that they classify them, uh, it, frankly, it, they get in their own way sometimes. Like, um, I, forget, I think it was, um, um, I think, yeah, I believe it was with the, um, well, I, I don't remember the details as well with this case, but I remember them better than others. Uh, with, in the case of Breonna Taylor, people pushed really hard for certain specific charges and the DA, the DAs involved were like, we can't get them for that, dude. If we charge them with that, they'll walk. And they're like, but they deserve it. Yeah. Like balance things out, like yeah. do what the law actually supports and then change the law. Yep. Right. There's, if, if you go about it from, from the, from the angle of the law is just a club that I can use to bludgeon people that, I believe have wronged me or my tribe. 
um, we're going to revert to being cavemen, just cavemen with cell phones and nukes. Yep, exactly. And you don't want that. <laughs> no, but instead, if you go, okay, let's look at the facts. Let's recognize extreme harm. Let's be better people. Let's not accuse people who haven't done wrong of doing wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, my state is doing silliness again. Not that it ever stops, but they're they're up on some silliness right now with uh, uh, prop. I think it's Prop 16. Prop 16 in in California is electing to try and uh, allow the active use uh, of race in job applications, meaning that. I can look at somebody's race and determine that they are that their race should award them favor in the job role instead of looking at the things that the job actually needs to have happen, right? So it's you're you're taking away some of the merit-based decisions and replacing them with tribal and identitarian-based ones. Uh, and if you look at someone and go, okay, you because of the color of your skin don't get the bonus points that this other person does, that that kind of sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I kind of remember a law that was passed in the 60s that says that that's not okay, personally. And yeah, I, I remember a series of extremely harmful laws named after some Jimmy guy. I don't know. <laughs> Jim, I'm sorry, there's just bells ringing everywhere. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the thing. And that's, I, I actually don't think I'd heard of that. I mean, I kind of assumed that they were had we're not far from having racial and gender quotas and boardrooms and stuff like that. I know that I've heard a lot of talk about those sorts of things, but the other thing too, like back to that Breonna Taylor case is the funny thing about all the people who are pushing for the max, like these crazy sentences that the situation doesn't actually warrant is now you don't actually get any sort of justice. Like if you got, if you put in like endangerment charges, and or manslaughter or something like that that's lower down some sort of neglectful sort of thing then you can maybe get these guys on charges get them brought up and for the people who actually did wrong get them into an actual trial where the facts come out see what happened and the people who were convicted they actually i don't know what the case is in because that's kentucky i don't know what the case is there but my guess is if you get convicted of something as a police officer and you get kicked off the force you probably lose pension you lose a lot of those things if you want to hit bad cops for being bad cops the biggest thing that you can do is take away those big benefits and in i the think that, book. And, and and that is i think something that people are so short-sighted on when they're like i want you know george floyd's the guy who whatever his name is who knelt on his neck to be brought up on murder charges it's like you don't have murder here i mean you have try him for treason because he betrayed the american people <laughs> Yeah, okay, I mean, prove that in a court of law, why don't you? I mean, it's like it's like people going back to the Alien and Sedition Acts. It's it's not it's it is a it is a terrifying place to be. And you know, to those who would say, well, maybe it's terrifying for you. What have you done in your past? Well, wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> All right. Um, it's it's one of those things. Like it's to play devil's advocate to your argument, right? Uh, if I if I told you and said, well, but those easier to get them for charges are not representative of what I believe they've done, right? I believe they've murdered somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Then I guess if you can convince the people who have to then convince a jury, right? If you can convince uh, what a jury of your peers that murder is the appropriate charge after two lawyers who have a vested interest in ensuring the jury is selected to vote their way, right? Mm -hmm. There's a jury selection process where legitimately people who uh, a lawyer is certain are not going to go their way. They excuse them and replace them, mm -hmm. right? And they keep doing that until they essentially have drafted their team. Yep. And once the draft is done, if you believe that you, if you believe murder is a thing and you can walk in there and convince people who will have access to the code of laws that are relevant to that. Um, if you can convince those people that murder is appropriate, then maybe it is. Yeah. But well, you're going to have a much harder time doing that than, uh, than, you know, just going out and screaming about it. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, even if you might say, Hey, this is how murder should be classified. Like I look at that and I see someone being murdered. 
you have to look at how murder is written into the law. What actually, like, what classifies a murder based on that state's laws? And if this action doesn't reach those standards, then guess what? Even if you think that that was a murder, by law, what's there, that's not what that says. And so you not only have to say this situation is murder and we can codify that in the law, right? It's how is it already written and do the facts of the case fit what's on the books? And to further play devil's advocate, what if your position on what is murder is not right and we can't afford to let that justice slip by Change while the, law. the laws don't support it? But before the trial? You can't. And, and that's where you have to take what you can get and um, that that may well be true uh I, I i couldn't help but play a little bit of devil's advocate why? there because I, I i have i have people on both sides of the argument i'm surrounded with that's the point of what i do mm-hmm. is uh is to let my personal beliefs be challenged by those with honestly held but different beliefs mm-hmm. my problem is when people dishonestly hold beliefs yeah i agree and, like people say we believe that like, for example, if, if you had Lindsey Graham say something like, we believe the Supreme Court is not a place for super legislators. It's a place for people to determine the constitutionality of law. Okay. Um, not buying it. Not buying it. Mm-mm. Nope. Like, if you were going to, if you're going to make that argument that she was supremely qualified, then she would probably be supremely qualified, not barely qualified. Right, like her record is not as long as her peers would, her peer, future potential peers would have when mm-hmm. they started, right? It's, it's just the truth. Yeah. So if you were trying to make an argument from this person is the right person because of their ability and their time and how seasoned they are in their in their ability to determine the constitutionality of law, you'd probably have to pick somebody who wasn't, what, seven years in. Mm-hmm. to to yeah. circuit court positions i don't know that, that'd be my argument about it and, I, I mean i just don't like the duplicity i don't like the the there's a there's a fancy word for it that i missed but the 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 nature of people to take advantage and say one thing when it's really effective but they don't mean that at all mm-hmm. yeah saying what's expedient instead of being honest and truthful or seeking truth so right pushing lies at one time and then looking at someone else and saying why are you allowing lies to be pushed right it's fairly familiar why you would you know people why are you pushing this this dossier of information essentially published by a russian spy well hmm, sounds familiar you know anyone named steel like (laughs) it's it's the it's the same thing you both you guys you know both both you silly parties of people uh, got questionable information and it was tied back to, you know, Russian intelligence services and mm-hmm. you decided to try and make hay with it. You try and impeach a president based on things that are not considered crimes. Yeah. Just things that are considered just moral, poor morals. Mm-hmm. And when, you know, to, to touch on what I imagine you talking about moral relativism, wanting to talk about that. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to win a case based on morals. The only people who are going to side with you are the people whose relativization matches your own, right? And generally today, in today's day and age, morals are not dictated by uh, the same thing that they used to be. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, people's morals in like today, today, people's morals are heavily influenced by what party they supposedly belong to and the rhetoric they're faced with. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. I think that we kind of sit in this sort of post-truth society as far not i mean obviously truth still it's true no matter what it's so truth truthiness yeah whether or not you recognize it it's still true but we have this kind of almost like what they had before you know socrates started with the greeks this sort of sophist uh a lot, a lot of focus on rhetoric focus on making undermining the other person's arguments instead of making a productive argument and seeking truth that's 
And that's really what Socrates was put to death for was the fact that he called people on their BS who were the sophists, the rhetoricians, and instead would ask them questions and undermine their positions by honestly seeking truth. And they couldn't, they couldn't like talk circles around him. So they killed him because he was annoying. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> What a way to go, Socrates. <laughs> Cheers to that, buddy. Cheers. Socrates. Man, that's crazy. Some dude who's just annoying at parties and just gets cool story, cool story bro literally to death. <laughs> like, stop asking me questions, Socrates. I'm tired of your BS. That's, that's nuts. I, I didn't really... I didn't really understand that. I'm not the biggest like philosophy guy. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a patterns guy. I'm a layman. I really am. Like I see patterns. I recognize them. Mm -hmm. That's why things like comedy come more naturally or at least more desirably to me. Uh, I, I like having the deep conversations. I do. It's just generally on my show, like cheap laughs and silliness uh, tends to pay out because I can find those better rather than asking me about, well, what are the implications of sophism on Socrates death? I, I could not have, I could like, I don't know, uh, at the intersection of, uh, of modern, uh, wait, 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 let me get up my, uh, my, uh, my Peterson impression. Let me see if I can do it. Uh, at the at the intersection of uh, uh, Aristotelian thought and, and Lockean thought and, and Hobbesian naturalism is, the place, the natural human state, and that natural human state says that you are responsible for your life, and things can go well if you let them. <laughs> that was a pretty good Pearson impression. <laughs> it's not so bad. Not so bad. Uh, well, I've yeah. heard like two videos with him, and it's like, that sticks in my brain. You forgot to mention Solzhenitsyn, but other than that, pretty solid. Uh, you gotta have Nietzsche. I mean, you mean like for a breakfast sandwich? <laughs> Sausage schnitzel? <laughs> I don't know who that is. <laughs> I don't know the difference between Solzhenitsyn and Shostakovich. <laughs> Couldn't tell him from Adam. <laughs> There's nothing in here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a void as big as anything. Free of awesome. Socrates. Uh, yeah, it's like it's like my brain is just repeating the scene of the oranges falling out of the bag from The Godfather, just just the oranges. That's what's going on in here, <laughs> and the oranges are brain cells. <laughs> yes, I mean, if if I was going to make an argument about the effectiveness of moral relativism and the and the the kind of the road that that puts us on, uh, I I couldn't do it without recognizing the. I guess the truthiness of the difficulties of the opposite. If we lived in a world where moral, moral rectitude was considered a single solitary path, um, it's also scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't want to have too much rigidity in it. You want, that's why I like, you know, you look at Aristotle, you look at uh, Confucius and kind of this idea of the mean walking, you know, different situations call for you to act differently. And so to be, to do something in one situation might be rash and crazy to do it in another, it might actually be a courageous thing to do, right? To take on a hundred people at once in a fist fight. Is it self-defense or murder? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ooh. Ooh. And, and so it's, it's definitely different. I, I think that that's the case. And there are a lot of times where I think, and I think that we're reacting against kind of a time where we did have too rigid of a moral uh compass that didn't allow for i don't know respecting a certain situation and a certain set of circumstances and what time frame do you think that was i think that like the sort of post uh post depression post world war ii era into the 60s had a lot of rigidity that people were Oh, back. the suit, the suit and tie madman era of things. The yeah. the airsats way we look at the past. I used a big word. <laughs> yeah, I think that that. I've era... always wanted to use that word in a sentence. <laughs> I love it. Did I do it right, Internet? 
Uh, You'll know if you didn't. That's for sure. You know, I've made a lot of mistakes on my show and I can't get people to give me feedback for my life. So I guess if I screw up, no one says anything. If I do well, no one says anything. <laughs> Fair. So I get a lot of free reign to screw up all I want. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You get some practice in and then when people, you know, are nitpicking you, hopefully you got everything all buttoned up and ready to go. That's the hope. That's the hope, but you know, it probably won't come true. I mean, uh, re reality sets in and reminds me how far from the path of truth I am. But I mean, it, if, if you make that argument, okay, can you be too rigid? Can you be too, you know, yes, you can be too rigid. Can you be too much of a relativist? Certainly you can be too much of a relativist, right? If you're too much of a relativist, you, you, you don't have, you don't stand on anything. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you could make an argument that you're probably 85, 95% there with the current duopoly and that you don't really know where they stand. Mm -hmm. If you say, well, like a Republican goes, well, we're against uh, spending money on things that are just bad. And they go, okay, well, I don't eat soybeans. Well, everything you eat is made with them. Uh, it, could that be because they were made cheap by my tax dollars? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. You I, know, like, I'd rather not eat as much soy as possible, like, or eat all the food, all my meat that I, you know, all the chickens and everything that are also fed soy. I, I don't necessarily want that personally. Well, yeah. And, and you go, okay, well, America loves meat. And what, what is animal food made of? Well, it's made of corn and soy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I want to buy something from the center aisles of a grocery store. What am I going to find in that? Almost every time? Things like partially hydrogenated soybean oil, corn syrup, uh, uh, soy lecithin, things like that. And it's not necessarily that there's, you know, I couldn't speak to if those things are healthy for you or not. I would imagine that many of them aren't. Uh, but what I can tell you is when you create economies of scale that uh, people can produce products off the backs of other people's tax money and they can do it cheaper, uh, they're going to find ways to fit that product into everything. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it, it, it just is. So now because corn and soy is so cheap, corn and soy are in everything. Yep. Exactly. Okay. What, what, what are we supposed to do about that? So when, when you have someone go, we're against, we're against spending money on things. That's just redistribution of wealth. Okay. Well, can you stop redistributing money through the farm bill to people who are making products that I don't really, I would rather have more expensive alternatives to soybean crackers. Really? Yep. yep. I'd rather have some free range chickens and beef to be able to buy instead of, well, things packed with soy and corn and other grains. Right. Personally. You know, can we just, can we just start subsidizing cocaine? Cause then we can have cocaine in our chicken. Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what'll happen. Like, Oh, you know what? We can make these chicken like grow insane muscles and whatever else we just pack their food full of cocaine. Mm -hmm. No. If it's cheap enough, that's all it takes. And for someone to say we're against spending and redistribution of wealth and then do that, mm -hmm. we, I don't believe you have any sort of principle to stand on. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the other side and you say, well, we believe that certain people, certain people's lives matter, but then the right looks at them and goes, well, what about unborn children? And you go, okay, can you stand on that principle effectively? How do you how do you reconcile the cognitive dissonance of saying that heart, you know, people who are alive matter, but you know, like in, in the words of uh, what did that be, George Orwell? Uh, uh, everyone's equal. Some people are more equal than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or you can shine light on George Floyd, who is this one case, and then ignore the fact that you know, however many black teens were shot in chicago over the weekend yeah right? it's, uh, it's usually around 40 in it problem but not this other one like but those lives actually didn't matter well uh, show dude uh uh what was it david dorn mm -hmm. right david dorn the black cop who was shot out in front of a store trying to supposedly protect it i don't know all the details but i know that that story hit the news for 30 seconds and then they tried they to never talk about it again yeah they realized that oh wait this that wasn't counteracts our narrative Oh, yeah. no. Wait, he wasn't shot by a white guy? Hurry. 
get, get, out of there. get, get it out of there. We, we can't, we can't make, we can't make the arguments we want to make using that information. Remove it. Yeah. No, exactly. It's gone. Exactly. It, there's a lot, a lot of absurdities. And that's why I think it's great that you're finding a way to laugh at the things that we have going on. And hopefully people out there are looking to laugh at some of these things. Cause I think as crazy as everyone's getting, yeah, I think that we need a little more laughter and a little more just levity about the situation. Yeah, and eventually there's things, you know, I'm starting an initiative to push out a lot more content. I'm building a, a ring of people, My the rest of my panel, uh, I'm trying to get them started on doing, they, they have a desire to do their own content. And so we're kind of starting to get them into producing content too. We're kind of just building this, this co-op basically where I figured out a lot of the editing and the publishing stuff and they can produce content. So we're kind of working together, you know, to, to get ourselves into a place where we can produce enough content to legitimately be worth, be something that's worth people's investment. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm, I'm kind of tired of people going, Hey, uh, I don't produce any special content, but give me money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like, you know, you have to, you have to make a value proposition. Like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I live in a capitalist world. I understand the rules that work. If I don't provide value, I don't eat. Yep, exactly. So you rally the troops, you build the best content you can. And it just seems to me like, you know, I'm not very good. I, I can see some trends, like the trends right now in, in uh, the top podcasts, they're all true crime or um, commentary, mm -hmm. right? And commentary split fairly even, evenly between left and right. Uh, and, and, and most of the time it's fairly obvious, you know, your Shapiro's, your Owens, your, uh, pod save America, your NPR, right. So you got your commentary and you got your true crime slash occult slash whatever that, that kind of stuff. I can't, I can't do those. I'm not a commentator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not, I, dude, I, I, if I ever met someone like Ben Shapiro, it'd be because I was being destroyed by him. <laughs> <laughs> like I can't debate like I, for crap. I, most of the time I just end up capitulating and picking apart what I can to try and get at the ooey goodness of the inside of people's ideas, but uh, not really trying to best them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that. And that's why I, you know, for me, I try to move towards truth and not, you know, get those, you own somebody videos. It's more like having a good dialogue and finding ways where you can kind of work together and take a conversation to something productive, learn something, teach something and have a good exchange. And I, I feel like I've had that so far today. So definitely good. Hey, that's awesome, man. I'm, I'm glad to, uh, I'm glad to be a, a, uh, a stone in the arch, so to speak of, uh, of open dialogue. And uh, I don't know, just trying really hard to make people laugh, I guess. Awesome. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a big old cynic. Uh, and uh, and and it, this is really beyond hopefully being something that people like. It's been kind of a coping mechanism for me so far, and it's turned into something uh, more professional recently. And I'm trying to, I'm really trying to do do well by the listenership here. So, That's awesome. Awesome. great. Well, you know, as we, I guess it's probably good to wrap up here. Definitely, my time starting to get a little late. So, Sean, where can uh, where can people find you? What do you want to shout out here? Well. Uh, I am at uh, bmnpod.com. That's my website. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Boston Makes the One. Um, I am on Anchor. I'm on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. And once you get on Apple Podcasts, they throw you all over the place. So I'm on most places by now. And you can find me under Boston Makes the News. Uh, if you go to my website, I have a Discord server. If you want to interact with me and some of my silly, silly friends and the panel and whatnot, it's supposed to be an interactive show. And if you listen to the show, you'll know that uh, I, uh, I have hashtags that I use for play along during, during the not live show, but mm -hmm. surprise, surprise, exclusive reveal. We're exploring the ability of our game show to handle live environments. Ooh, nice. That's awesome. It's exciting. We're looking into it. So that's where you can find me. Please look me up. Come say hello. I'm around. Definitely. Definitely go and check out what Sean's doing and let him know. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks, dude. Give me a call sometime. I'm around. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Conversation for Our Generation. If you enjoyed this, definitely head over to conversationforgeneration.com 
for more content like this. You can check out my interviews with Amy Mastrini, an amazing artist, Zach, the architect. Uh, I have others coming up with the stained glass cell. It will be coming out soon. And we have just lots of great conversations with the Vital Masculinity guys and many more. So definitely check that out. There's a lot of great content there. And while you're there, head over to conversationforgeneration.com slash podcast or wherever you're already listening and subscribe to the Conversation for Generation so that you don't miss an episode going forward. I got book reviews every Friday, great conversations and or solo episodes from me every Tuesday and just lots of good stuff happening at the Conversation for Generation. So definitely check that out and let me know what you think. If there's anyone out there that I should be having on, let me know and definitely check out what's going on with Boston Makes the One. It's at Boston Makes the One. That's the number one on Twitter. And check them out. Check out the podcast as well, which <clears throat> which is the BMN Pod. Check that check that out and let me know what you think of what's going on there and let him know as well. I'm sure he'd appreciate the subscribe and everything as well. Their good rating and review, all that good stuff too. So thank you for listening to this episode of the Conversation for Our Generation. Let's get the dialogue going. I'll talk to you next time.